we are going to post the recording of this presentation online later this week, and you can find that on our Healthy Food Systems page under 2014 Calls and Presentations. That's it for me. Thanks, Gail. Thank you. Today I'd like to welcome Claire Fox, who will be is a Director of the Policy and Innovation of the Los Angeles Food Policy Council. She collaborates closely with a large network of food advocates, public and private sector representatives to catalyze projects and build leadership capacity for a sustainable and equitable food system in Southern California. Claire directs the Healthy Neighborhood Market Network, an initiative to bring business and leadership development opportunities and consulting to neighborhood markets in low-income communities who wish to sell more fresh and healthy food. Claire has a master's in urban planning from UCLA and has previously consulted for a range of community and environmental and labor organizations. And with Claire joining us today, she will be highlighting the Healthy Neighborhood Market Network approach, discuss collaborations with the LA County Environmental Health, and review the FAQ developed with the county and compliance issues that are, arise with the market operators as they did to start off fresh and locally produced food. Welcome, Claire. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. <clears throat> Should we uh, just launch into the slides? Sure. Awesome. Great. Thanks, everyone. I'm really excited to be here to talk to you a little bit about our project, the Healthy Neighborhood Market Network. To get us started, I thought it might be helpful to provide a little bit of context and background on the LA Food Policy Council very briefly. If you want to advance to the next slide, please. Uh, our organization is a nonprofit that was created by the City of LA and incubated through the previous mayoral administration to serve as a collective impact organization. And our overarching goal is to make Southern California a good food region for everyone. Next slide. And the way we define good food is healthy, affordable, fair, and sustainable. So as a food policy council, we're among, um, I think it's over 200 now, food policy councils across North America. I like to call food policy councils an innovation and adventure in democracy because the idea is really to bring together diverse stakeholders that represent every sector of what we would describe as the food system. So everything from production all the way through distribution and processing to retailing and all of the myriad issues that come across um, in, in each of those sectors. Um, you know, everything from hunger to workers' issues uh, to access, equitable access to healthy food and, and the resulting public health um, disparities that we see as a result. Um, and get everyone talking to each other in a new way, trying to get that 360 view on what's happening across the entire landscape um, and the region so that we're able to come up with solutions that are holistic and um, hopefully transformative for the long term. Next slide. So our sort of concentration areas, the goals, what we're out here to achieve is that we want to see a thriving good food economy for everybody who participates in the value chain as workers or as uh, businesses. We want to see strength in agricultural and environmental stewardship and, of course, better health and well-being for all of our residents. And um, again, I want to reiterate that we see each of these pieces as inherently connected to each other and that to really win in each of these categories, we need to connect the dots and, and make sure that we're kind of busting out of our silos to, to think broadly about these issues. Next slide. Next slide, please. So the way that we do that is by working across sectors and issues, as I mentioned. A little bit about our structure, we have a board of almost 40 uh, food system experts uh, that you know, are hailing from each of these sectors. We work with nonprofit, for-profit, and public sector uh, representatives and officials. Beyond our board, uh, we have seven different working groups that are focusing on issue, direct issue areas. And the work that I'm going to talk about today with the Healthy Neighborhood Market Network is actually a project of one of our working groups. It's the working group on healthy food retail and food equity. And then beyond the working groups, and I would say within those working groups, we have about 100 very actively engaged stakeholders that um, are using those 
working group spaces as a place to collaborate and give life to either policy recommendations or new projects, depending on what the needs are. Beyond that, those working groups, we have regular network meetings, and I'd say within our network there's about 500 engaged organizations and individuals who are regularly connecting into the space. It's a wonderful place to um, kind of get a landscape of who's doing what. We say that our, our mantra is catalyze, coordinate, and connect. Um, and so we like C's, and I've added a few of my own, which is that I think the Food Policy Council serves as a crossroads uh, for capacity building. So those are my two additional C's to catalyze, coordinate, connect, um, just to give you a sense of, of how we operate and what our work is about big picture. Next slide, please. So zeroing in a little bit on, on the equity aspects of our work um, and how that's played out in the city of Los Angeles, we know that there are too many communities, low-income communities and communities of color that face a dearth of healthy food options. Um, there are not enough quality food retail establishments to meet the needs of communities. Um, there's been some great work to document a report done by Social Impact and uh, I believe Emerging Markets, which Daniel is uh, a member of, was a part of that study that looked at there was actually something around $113 million in grocery retail leakage from areas like South LA and East LA. So what that tells us is that there is an unmet demand. You know, people are looking for food, but they can't achieve, they can't find it in their neighborhood. So one of the ways that we've um, thought to address this is by looking at the existing food landscape. And in parts of the city of LA, like South Los Angeles and Boyle Heights, East LA, parts of the San Fernando Valley as well, what you see instead of full service grocery stores or farmers markets is a lot of small stores, corner stores, convenience stores, liquor stores, mom and pop shops that have sort of filled the void. Many of them stocked with low nutrients, high caloric food, or food like substances, as Michael Pollan says. Um, some of them with fresh produce or meat. You know, there's a lot of carniferias, meat markets, uh, or even some produce markets. Um, so it's a really diverse landscape, but our thought is that while we see uh, as a parallel strategy to incentivizing and attracting new healthy food retail establishments to underserved neighborhoods, we also want to invest in the existing food infrastructure into small businesses that are community serving that would like to advance their operation and, and provide more healthy food options to the community, but they need some support and they need some resources to do so. Um, just to so kind of give you a, a sense of the landscape and, and the density of small stores, uh, South LA, for example, has three times as many small stores as compared to West LA, which is a more affluent part of the city. So again, this is about in investing in what is and sort of trying to pivot that existing infrastructure while at the same time bringing new fresh uh, retail into the area. Next slide. So with this in mind, um, as the existing context and conditions, the Healthy Food Retail Working Group of the LA Food Policy Council saw that there was a lot of interest in corner store conversions, market makeover projects happening around the county, happening in the city of LA, but really ha happening around the county and around the country, and happening on different scales. But the one thing that we didn't see happening was ongoing technical assistance support for these projects to really ensure their sustainability. Um, so the working group kind of got, we got our heads together and launched a business and leadership development training for small neighborhood markets who are interested in offering healthier food. This first, the first training was called, I think, From Corner Store to Community Grocer, Everything You Need to Know to Be a Healthy Food Retailer. And since then, it's become the Healthy Neighborhood Market Network, which is a resource network where we're putting small stores in touch with industry experts so that they could get the kind of uh, technical assistance they need on marketing and produce management. All of our trainings are multilingual, and we actually have language-specific trainings as well. Um, it's a very multilingual sector. So we do trainings in Korean, we do trainings in Spanish, and then all of our um, larger trainings are translated. So if the content is in English, it will be translated out into Korean and Spanish. We've touched through our outreach efforts, about 400 stores across the county. And that's just touching. Um, this is a, a, a sector of small businesses that, you know, a lot of them are not on email. 
um, or aren't even really used to getting outside of their store environment to participate in conferences or workshops. Of that 400, about half of them have actually participated and showed up. Um, and we're at a place in the process we've had, um, it says seven trainings held between 2012 and 2014. We have two more to go this year. So we've had five trainings. And um, I think the Healthy Neighborhood Market Network is at the place where store owners are starting to become very engaged and see themselves as members of this network, which is exactly our goal. We want them to see this as their network uh, where they can continue to build their skills and continue to get the support that they need to make sure that healthy food really becomes operationalized into their business. Next slide. So just to give you a little bit of a sense of the kinds of uh, topics that we cover at these trainings, we cover product handling and storage, marketing, merchandising, store design and layout, brand strategy, uh, because if you're, inter if you're moving in the direction of healthy food and you're serious about it, then you're talking about a shift in your business model. And we really want store owners to think of, of it from that point of view. We want them to understand you know, the health needs in their community and how they could be a part of addressing those. But we don't, ultimately, we want them to figure out how this is going to make sense for them as a, as a business model. And uh, I think that has to do with creating a brand around that. Uh, also, we look a lot at profitability factors around fresh food, fresh produce. Um, as, as is known, uh, fresh produce, fruits and vegetables are not um, they're not huge margin items, but there are strategies that can be employed to kind of increase profitability um, or to use other elements of the business model to drive profitability that can help support the fresh food offering. Um, and we do a lot to connect the stores to vendors um, or to opportunities around energy efficiency, uh, financing, even accounting and bookkeeping. Bookkeeping. So again, we're really looking at the whole business model and, and hoping that in becoming a healthy food retailer, this will be systematized. Next slide. These are um, some images from our training to give you a sense. The image at the bottom right corner is actually um, a project that we were directly involved in as a market makeover project, but it's, um, we consider it sort of a demonstration site where we're learning a lot um, on the ground. And we partner with several other community-based organizations on their market makeover projects as well. But the, our purpose in that as the Food Policy Council is really to glean, um, you know, what are some of the systemic problems that corner store owners are facing in this work and how can we come up with systemic solutions that then could be scaled up for the entire network. So that's really our objective in, in being involved directly in market makeover projects. Next slide. So in response to the feedback that we've received from neighborhood market owners, we've created a resource guide that uh, covers a lot, it sort of brings together the best of the curriculum that's been deployed at the training. And uh, this is a space where we have collaborated with the Department of Public Health, which I'll speak to in a moment. But just to give you a sense of, of the resource guide that we're working on, it's, um, it's in its final stages. We haven't released it yet, but um, I really look forward to sharing that resource when it is available. In the resource guide, we're covering business tips. Again, you know, these are tips from business and retail experts and experienced market owners and distributors as well as government uh, agencies on how to operationalize healthy food. Uh, we provide healthy food vendor profiles. These are exclusive vendor contacts for whole fruits, healthy snacks, grab-and-go meals, and, and then additional referrals, again, for financing opportunities, business counselors, et cetera, or other organizations like neighborhood institutions that are willing to support changes in, a, in an ongoing way at store environment. Next slide. Uh, this is an, an overview. The, the resource guide was an opportunity for us to aggregate a lot of the information that our trainers were presenting at the training event, uh, but also to address some of the frequently asked questions that we get from store owners. So this is an outline of the resource guide. It's quite a lot, but um, you see that I bolded and underlined it. Permits and food safety. We get a lot of questions on that, and that's a place where obviously we needed to reach out to our partners at the Environmental Health Division of the LA County Department of Public Health to really understand you know, to answer those questions first and foremost and to, to translate 
um, the already very helpful material that the Environmental Health Department had a, has available to translate it specifically to the context of corner store conversion. Next slide. And these are the, the main questions that we got. Um, I'm worried that if I start carrying produce, I'm going to have more field inspections. And just, to, you know, so a lot of questions around, okay, well, I'm interested, but I'm hesitant because I don't know what can of worms this is going to open up. So we found that there's a lot of misinformation um, and just um, fear, quite frankly, that comes from different kinds of experiences. And so we wanted to just out the gate be able to uh, speak to these issues and allay any concerns. Taking a step back for a moment, um, the permits and food safety part of the resource guide, we start by laying out some key terms. So talking about what is a food facility, what does potentially hazardous food mean, uh, what does it mean to be a food demonstrator, et cetera. So starting with some kind of a glossary. And then some quick tips on food safety. And then getting into the question. So with number one, what we found, um, and I'll also let uh, Jim Dragon at the Environmental Health Department speak to this more extensively if that's of interest, is that, no, in fact, there wouldn't be an increase in, in, in inspections. That would not be triggered by incorporating whole fruits and vegetables or cut prepackaged fruits and vegetables which are not prepared on site. That's the bottom line. As long as the products are not being prepared on site, which would open up a whole other area of um, food certification, then you're fine. It shouldn't be that big of a deal. And then the second question is just a general sort of what types of permits and certifications do the neighborhood markets need to know about, especially if they're moving in the direction of healthy food. So in the resource guide and, and in our direct consulting, we, we talk about that, um, the different kinds of public health facility per permits that they may need. Um, if they're interested in doing sampling, which comes up a lot, um, as a way to promote healthy foods on site at their stores. That kind of gets into question three, if I want to offer samples, what do I need to know? Is this possible? Um, it is possible, but you would need to look into a food handler's card or a food demonstrator license. Um, so, you know, again, depending on what kind of food you're serving or sampling, rather, and whether or not it's prepared on or off site, that's going to trigger uh, different kinds of uh, permits and certifications and food safety training that the store owner and or his or her employees will need to obtain. So those are the sort of things that we've been able to uh, uncover with the help of environmental health. We couldn't have done that on our own because obviously we don't, we don't directly regulate those issues. But um, I think it was, it was really helpful to have a space um, where we could get store, a bunch of store owners in the room together and giving us that, that feedback. There's a lot of interest in moving in the direction of healthy food, but there's a lot of reticence as well, just simply because there's a lot of there's misinformation or there's not enough information. And um, the Environmental Health Department has um, some really helpful brochures and resources that are available on the website. So what we saw our role was is to, to do that translating work and to kind of take that, glean from that information that's already available uh, what is most relevant to the context of market makeover projects. Next slide. So those are my comments, and this is my contact information. Please feel free to reach out uh, with any other thoughts or questions. Thanks so much. Thank you, Claire. Gail, are you still there? Thank you, Claire. As, as we said, that was really, really uh, beneficial to all of us. With this, I'd like to go on to the next uh, speaker who we are so lucky to have is Jeff Dragon, who is the Chief Environmental Health Specialist for the Consultative Services Program of the County of Los Angeles Department of Public Health. The Consultative Services Program engages in activities to foster a greater understanding of local health departments, compliance policies, and related state and federal codes. James has over 25 years of environmental health experience and has been in his current position since 2008. He has served on several committees with the Los Angeles County and is currently education liaison for environmental health. He has also participated in statewide committees, including the California Retail Food Safety Coalition and is currently the coordinator for the Los Angeles County Food Safety Advisory Council. James will be talking about 
remarks on collaboration with Healthy Neighborhood Market Network, environmental health stepping outside its traditional role and engaging more visibly in the education and about food safety, perhaps drawing on one or two examples. Welcome, James. Thank you very much, um, and I'm happy to be here. I, I really do appreciate being invited to talk. Uh, our collaboration um, <clears throat> with the, um, the group has been really great, and we've enjoyed it. Uh, I'll start by going to the first slide and kind of what people normally think about what we do, our traditional roles. All those pictures we're inspecting, we're measuring, we're checking uh, for compliance. Um, that's traditionally what we do, and it's all very important uh, in providing public health protections. Uh, and then we can go to the next slide. We, um, uh, this is just kind of, I'll just go through this real quick. We don't need to read that, but these are a lot of the uh, industries that we uh, regulate as far as looking for uh, compliance with state and local codes. Um, and again, it's, it's important for us to be looking at that. Uh, it's, to you know, for us to provide our public health protections, it's very important. One area that we've kind of branched out into that we traditionally haven't done is, is in the way of education and outreach to the industries that we, um, we regulate. Uh, if we can go to the next slide. Um, as an example of that collaboration, a while back we changed our food inspection report for the food retail markets and restaurants. And in developing the new inspection report, we decided, hey, you know, we had some choices to make and we got together with some industry uh, folks and asked for their input. We gave them different samples of what we were going to propose and we wanted to know what did industry want, uh, what would they prefer, what is easier for them to use. And it worked out great. They gave us some uh, input and uh, on the left there you'll see that's in a reference guide that we created for the new inspection report which is listed, shown there uh, over the top of it. Uh, another example is on the right there, we produced some guidelines. It's, it's basically a public uh, or industry outreach document. And again, this is about guidelines for food, safe food donation. So we asked for assistance from the industry. We got together with um, retail food uh, markets who do uh, donate quite a bit of food uh, to charitable organizations. And we also got the organizations who receive and redistribute this food to um, people in need. We got input from both of them. What should be on here? What, what are their hang-ups? What are they finding problems with? And how should we approach that on our document here? And so through that input, we, we created that document, which worked out pretty good. And we, in turn, began to provide some education to the industry, the food industry, on these changes, the, the new food inspection report, uh, and we have included uh, um, the guidelines on safe food donation also in some training outreach. <clears throat> and we can go to the next uh, slide. Um, another way we've kind of moved uh, towards that direction is, uh, as an example, uh, AB 1252, which became law in January of 2014 for, this is for retail restaurants, it requires no bare hand contact with ready food. And this is a, a new change that could result in problems as far as the operators uh, getting cited for violations. LA County decided to take an educational approach to begin this process, and we have our inspectors going out uh, during their inspection and explaining the new law to the, prop to the business owner so that they understand it and they can make changes to comply with that law. Uh, and as well as we've done uh, in my group here in consultative services, we've done quite a bit of uh, outreach to the industry. We've set up uh, educational symposiums. Uh, we've been part of um, business expos where we will pr provide this as part of our presentation just to make sure that people understand it. And we're finding that this type of interaction with industry really is beneficial in the end even to us because when the industry understands what the law is requiring, more likely they'll be able to um, uh, provide what they need to do to comply. Uh, we can go to the next slide. Um, this is just another example. When the cottage food uh, law went out, we did, um, this is where, this law allows uh, individuals from their home to produce certain 
non potentially hazardous foods to sell to the public, uh, which is very new to California. Uh, it's never occurred here before. Uh, other states have this particular law in place as well. But now this, this is a document example that went to, we did outreach to both the food industry and to the general public because now with this new law, uh, the general public, anybody can, if they meet the requirements, begin to prepare food for, the, for public uh, sales. And also the industry would need to know also because these foods may become part of the, um, their food chain. So this is an example of where uh, education, again, is very beneficial to, uh, to the public uh, and industry alike. Uh, this next slide, it's just kind of where do we do our public outreach and industry outreach? Uh, we'll just kind of go through the slides pretty quick, but it, we do it at community events, um, schools and universities. We've provided presentations there, uh, just general presentations at different industries um, and partnerships. We've partnered with some cities. Uh, we did partner with um, uh, several uh, business expos, uh, including uh, some with, um, with the um, – uh, Healthy Neighborhood Markets Network. Uh, and so these have been very beneficial. <clears throat> the, our collaboration with Healthy Neighborhood Markets has been extremely beneficial. One of the things that's most useful for us as a public health agency is the fact that they're targeting uh, the small businesses, business owners in small neighborhoods, whether it's a small neighborhood market, Traditionally, these are very difficult um, areas for us to reach uh, because generally it's a, a one-owner business, it's a family-owned business, and they're not part of necessarily part of uh, a larger organization that we can kind of communicate through. Uh, and this is one of the big benefits of the Healthy Neighborhoods Market Network is it brings a lot of resources to these businesses uh, who don't really get the attention they deserve uh, sometimes. So uh, our collaboration with them has been great. Um, overall, goal is certainly in line with public health's view of bringing healthier food alternatives to areas that are, are underserved. Uh, that's certainly one of our um, things we would like to see. Uh, success depends on the small business owners incorporating this in their neighborhood markets. Um, and uh, the, on the screen, there's, there's a couple of uh, trifold things that uh, were created. Um, as a result of some of our outreach. It's kind of a short and abbreviated version uh, on how people can look at, uh, consider if they want to consider remodel or they want to open a new business, it kind of gives them a guideline on how to um, begin the process. And I think a lot of people get stuck on, um, they, they don't know where to start. And, and I think one of the, uh, it was mentioned just earlier in the previous presentation that some people are, are afraid of what the consequences might be. And they may not want to ask their inspector when the inspector comes out checking for compliance. Um, and that's one of the great things about the network is that they can forward some of these questions to us. We can maybe assist uh, that person who may have questions. They want to add produce to their uh, market, but they don't know where to start and they don't know what is this going to mean for me? Is, what is the cost going to be? We can kind of help them with that. <clears throat> um, uh, yeah, they can, uh, there's several different ways that they can bring produce in there. It depends on how far the business owner wants to go. If they, if they have a, a permitted market and they just want to bring in whole produce to sell, there's not a, there's not a lot they need to do, um, and it won't be a lot of cost up front. Uh, now, if they want to go and start processing and cutting, there may be some other requirements, but they can make that decision based on, on what, they, what they learn. Uh, as far as, um, you know, upgrading their facilities. Uh, so um, I, I'm not sure what else to say other than the collaboration with the Healthy Neighborhoods Market has been great. We've done presentations. Uh, we did um, at, the, uh, re at the LA Trade Tech College. I think there was a slide that showed earlier. We participated in that. Uh, very, very beneficial. Um, and we will continue to help with the resource guide, any updates or, or questions that come up. And um, we look forward to continuing this, this collaboration. I, I think it's a great, uh, a great way for 
a business owner to start bringing more healthy foods to the areas that really don't get that right now. Uh, large markets have marketing people, they have uh, food safety people, they have uh, all kinds of uh, you know, people who do the ordering. A small mom and pop type business, they have the owner basically. And that owner has to do all of these tasks. Uh, so I think this collaboration really will help those small businesses get um, kind of a, I guess, a level playing field for what they want to do in, in their business. And, and hopefully the community and all of that will benefit uh, from this. So uh, we're on board with this and we are very pleased to be part of uh, this group. Um, so that's pretty much it. I, I had the last slide is just basically uh, maybe it's kind of a plug for uh, our um, um, healthy alternatives. Public health is very uh, big on healthier choices, and this is just our Choose Health pr program that's really geared towards restaurants who want to offer a healthier alternatives. And so, just to kind of make that connection, that we are uh, we are very much uh, for healthier choices for the community to um, to have. And, you know, I didn't include my uh, contact information at the back, but I can uh, follow up with that at uh, a later date. Sure, we can email that out to everyone. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Gail, do you need to unmute yourself? Sorry, thank you, James, for, for a go. wonderful presentation. I was talking uh, on, on mute, so I apologize <laughs> to the group. It was great to hear uh, uh, the environmental health perspective for the um, healthy neighborhood markets. I have to say this week I traveled through across the nation through Chicago and Pittsburgh, and I am seeing healthy markets in both cities and what the work they're doing, and even in the airport. So I think we're, our group is definitely on the right track. And with that, I want to bring our next speaker, Daniel Tellian, is the principal emerging markets, it's principal of Emerging Markets, Inc., an economic development consulting firm that assists the public and private sector to responsibly pursue business opportunities in low-income areas nationwide. Daniel leads client engagements in the firm, uh, regional banking, and food retailing sectors. He currently serves as the firm's lead for deployment of the more than $270 million, yes, I said $270 million California Fresh Works Fund, the nation's largest healthy food financing initiative. Daniel is an attorney, commercial developer, suicide public accountant, former nonprofit executive, and alternative leader and lender. He has an economics degree from the Wharton School of Business and graduate degrees in law from the business from the UC Berkeley. So with that, uh, he will be giving us his perspective on the opportunities and an overview of work with the Food Financing Fund. Welcome, Daniel. And Daniel, if you're speaking, you may need to unmute yourself with star six. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Um, thank you so much, and, and thank you for having me here this afternoon. Uh, I just real quickly wanted to uh, go over some of the opportunities that apply to small stores regarding the California Fresh Works Fund. Uh, as was mentioned in, in, in the bio, um, uh, I work with a group that uh, consults with the food retail industry, and so we're fairly familiar with that industry from larger markets uh, down, to, down to small stores and food entrepreneurs. And within that context, one of the uh, primary things we've been working on the last few years is deploying capital statewide into food entrepreneurs, predominantly food retailers and distributors, through a a impact investing fund or a, or a sort of a, a, a public-private loan fund um, called the California Freshworks Fund. And so really uh, the only point I would probably make today, and I think in front of you is a map uh, that shows an example of some of the places uh, where, we've, where we've put some of our investments, which 
uh, hopefully this is an interest of the people on the phone and that it, it, it represents a decent amount of the Southern California and California communities. Um, but really just wanting to answer that question of how do we really help these food entrepreneurs offer more healthy foods and get where they need to go? I think that the, the, the technical assistance and the regulatory assistance uh, is, is so important and, and it can help educate these entrepreneurs on where they need to go. But ultimately, at some point, there's going to be a need for financial assistance as well. Uh, oftentimes, these businesses are, are the sole source of, of income for smaller entrepreneurs, and their access to capital in any form generally um, remains at friends, family, and, and other more organic means. And so the fund was created to have a financing mechanism or in some on some level, be a bank with a with a better a better heart and a better motive to help food entrepreneurs, with the goal of of increasing access to healthy food in communities that need it, and to spur some economic development and innovation along the way. Um, so that's what our fund does. We lend to enterprises, and we lend to enterprises that want to increase access to healthy food. Next slide, please. The real issue that we have and what we lend, and, and as was mentioned, this fund is fairly large because the scale of the problem and the size of the state is large. It's, it's, it's several hundred million dollars. And so at the end of the day, um, we don't make a lot of microloans. We do loans of a quarter million dollars and up and, 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 and become ultimately a, a bit of a commercial banker for independent markets and, and larger grocery stores, which are very important to economic development and the foodscape uh, along the way. But it's really an insufficient tool for working with some of our smallest food enterprises, which we know uh, in the trenches is where a lot of the battle is, is won and lost. And so we've attempted to create a mechanism or a financial product to help get uh, smaller bursts of capital to healthy food enterprises and sort of what we call in creditor speak more risky enterprises that we're really trying to get uh, a first loan or some sort of help to as they try to do a market makeover or, or perhaps start a small food and uh, distribution or retailing business or something like that. Um, so this graphic just sort of is an example of how something like this works, and we do it through what's referred to as an intermediary lending program, which is essentially an acknowledgement that we can't um, get $270 million of money out, $5,000 at a time, uh, up and down the state of California with our staff. We would be here a very long time. But some of our investors, and you can see some of the ones at the top there that have invested in this particular small market lending style program, um, they make investments. Uh, the Freshworks Fund itself is a whole variety of investors. Uh, the lead investor uh, was the California Endowment. Who, who, who essentially designed and helped uh, create the, the fund, uh, has been joined by other public health um, agencies and funders like Kaiser and uh, First Five LA uh, has also invested in this small, this small food piece. But we would like to take our monies and invest them at very favorable and patient terms into local intermediaries that represent smaller geographies that have more of an interest and a capacity in assisting small food enterprises that are looking to uh, bring more healthy inventory into, into their sales, um, and then invest in those intermediaries, which can then deploy capital at a much uh, more micro scale. And then you can sort of see not only do small bursts of capital come into that, but also this then uh, provides the opportunity at hopefully some level of scale to conduct the outreach and, and the technical assistance activities that are so important to what's going on. So ultimately, we would see ourselves not as a direct investor, which is how we, we make do deals for larger supermarkets and neighborhoods that, that need them, uh, but to be almost a wholesaler, where we would then be the banker to a series of intermediaries that could then touch these smaller food, uh, these smaller businesses. Next slide. And this is going to be my last slide. I just, what does that actually mean? What are the types of local intermediaries that could that could carry out something like this that might have an interest in it, or that might um, might be willing to play that role? And, and we have made investments already, uh, both up and down the state, of intermediaries that could do that. But I would say these are people who understand a certain geography, that have a certain mission fit, uh, and have uh, certain capacities to handle money and 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 run some some semblance of a, 
a microloan or small business lending program in conjunction with programmatic assistance around food or public health. So we might invest in a, in a community development corporation that's looking to revitalize a certain impacted neighborhood or a community development financial institution, which is a sort of separate federally certified type of organization that does lending and small business lending in neighborhoods in most most urban and, and some rural communities in, in California uh, have CDFIs that serve them. It could be universities who are interested in, in, in the, uh, the public health impacts of corner stores. It could be public health and food advocacy and policy organizations such as those that were presenting here today. So it could be nonprofit entities as such. It could also absolutely be public entities, which I know is the, the, the primary audience on this phone call. So there's no reason why a city or a county couldn't take down some of our capital to then use as a small store lending program. And uh, the lending piece might be run out of a economic development department or um, a, a mayor's office or something like that. We've seen these things before in various smaller cities. And then a lot of the technical assistance and outreach pieces could be complemented through the public health departments and, or the entities within a various municipality that actually connects with those small markets. It could be the whole city or county itself. It could be a business improvement district or some area that represents uh, a specific geography. It could even be a for-profit entity. And so we see um, some... Uh, grocery industry partners who, who work with small retailers. These could be food distributors or these could be uh, equipment manufacturers. Um, these folks also can offer financing terms. So at the end of the day, our interest in pushing out capital, not just to the larger markets, but to the smaller markets, is going to be predicated on the ability to find intermediaries at the local level uh, that are willing to take on a corner store program or have an ability to connect and, and assist in that financing activity. And so I just make the plug, and you can see uh, my contact information at the bottom. I know this is a very sort of cursory uh, path at, at the model, and what we're looking at is it's fairly well-baked. Um, but if that's something that in your area or within your municipality is something of interest to you and you'd like to learn more about how something like that might work, uh, I'd be happy to talk to you. We've done a number of presentations at various uh, public entities and nonprofit entities who are interested in this. And this is something that we have um, several million dollars of, of fairly uh, patient and affordable capital that we can, we can bring to this problem and we want to be part of that solution. So I'll, I'll probably just uh, pause there and, and hand it back off to our moderator, uh, but hopefully that's helpful in some of how can we resource this activity. Thank you. Thank you. Gail, you may be muted again. Sorry. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it your financial perspective. And with this, I would like to invite Carla to uh, go ahead with the rest of the call. Hi, this is Carla Blackmar, and I'm the project manager for the Public Health Alliance of Southern California. I just want to thank all of our presenters for their amazing work, and it's really interesting to sort of hear this uh, trilogy of perspectives on this complicated issue, but it sounds like collaboratively uh, some great work is being done in this area. So I just wanted to open it up uh, for questions from our attendees. And please remember that if you want to speak, you have to uh, press star six to unmute yourself. And that is in addition to any unmuting that you might need to do on your own internal line. So um, we'll pause here for a second and see if we can get some questions. Maybe while we're having people work on uh, unmuting themselves, and also you're welcome to type any questions you may have into the chat box. I wanted to um, just open up with a few questions uh, that, that came to my mind as I was listening to this. Um, one question that I had was uh, in terms of the, and I guess this is a question maybe for Claire, 
what business models do you see are are working most effectively in terms of bringing um, fresh food into neighborhood stores or corner stores? Um, is it primarily a snacking market? Is it a market? Is it a cooking market? Is it um, something that that retailers are finding success in providing um, products for uh, people who might not be able to make it to a large grocery store except, you know, once every two weeks or something. I was just wondering what, what business model was working in those cases. Hmm. Well, I think there's been a lot of experimentation in the space of corner store conversions and neighborhood markets and that um, from sort of in the practitioner space, there's a lot of learning about the different typologies of neighborhood markets that are out there and just how how vastly different some of these stores are. And that made it a little bit challenging because programmatically the way that these projects have been approached in the last five to ten years has really been very produce-focused and very, just essentially very focused on getting fruits and vegetables into the store um, as sort of a bottom line, you know, of what we want to see out of these projects. But as we're growing as a field, I think, in this work, we're seeing that, that there is no one-size-fits-all. Um, and our approach has been that, to appreciate that each business is going to be unique and that the process of figuring out um, what, their, what a store's pivot into healthy food will look like is going to very much depend on the skills and capacity and vision and leadership of the store owner, him or herself, and really where they're at right now and starting from where they're at. So with that sort of starting from where we're at point of view, we've tended to move away from a produce focus or to you know, really work from convenience product categories and figuring out how to bring in healthier alternatives to the kind of ready-to-eat, grab-and-go foods that are already on the shelf. Because um, a lot of the small stores that we're working with are essentially convenience stores. Um, people are not looking for fresh food that they need to prepare at home yet. Um, at least that's, that's not the expectation. That's not the occasion for going to these small stores. They're looking for something they could eat on their way out. And that might include produce, snackable fruit, for example, um, anything that you can literally pop in your mouth um, while walking out the door. So I wouldn't say that there's a one-size-all, one-size-fits-all business model that's going to make the most sense for every store. But in our work, we've tended to move away from that, you know, heavy, heavy focus on creating a fresh produce department of a convenience store, and instead you know, looking at what they have in the store already. And, and, in fact, a lot of small stores have staple food items, but they tend to be hidden. So in bringing in healthier food, healthy snacks, and healthy alternatives to the snack categories they already have on the shelves, how to re-merchandise the staple food items that are in the store. I'm thinking here of, you know, beans and rice and spaghetti, spaghetti sauce, and really bring that forward, reposition it in the store environment to – parlay with some new healthy snacks or some new fresh fruit um, and drawing up and investing in their, their brand equity as a healthy food store. So those are some of the strategies that we've employed. Um, but again, I would say there's not, there's not going to necessarily be one, one um, business approach that's going to work for every store. That's, that's fascinating. Thank you for that answer. Um, Hi, this is Daniel. I, uh, I, w I would maybe uh, add as well, and some of the things that we're seeing on our side is that certainly looking at the, the, the if you, how would I say, changing a corner store for someone who has for many, many years just been running something off of sort of a liquor and tobacco model is very difficult. That's a, unless there's something that has changed there, like there's been a generational change of ownership or a, a, a true change of ownership, it's very hard to change an owner who's just been sort of stuck in a certain mindset uh, to, a, to a truly sort of healthy format. But there are many people who happen to, based on their circumstances, have, have purchased or rent a small space 
that may look like a, a sort of convenience store, but really are aspiring grocers. And these are some of these people who just have a couple of bananas and in that you know, six square feet of space they have, they try and put something. It's because they have a, a, a aspiration of being a grocer, and I think those are folks that are more productive to tap into from a willingness point of view. And, and I think Claire and the Food Policy Council do a great job of trying to distill out those folks who have the right, the interest sort of baked in that they want to, they envision their final product or their final retail place being somewhere else. And then I'd also say that... Um, Stores, small stores that um, seek to sort of go head-to-head with large grocers on sort of commodity items like diapers and ketchup generally do not fare very well unless they're truly the only game in town for a long time, and that they can be more successful if they have something unique that a local grocer or supermarket wouldn't carry. So if they have some extraordinary prepared food or fresh food or ethnic specialty that will draw traffic in, then once somebody's there, I think they're willing to buy ketchup or diapers or whatnot. But there needs to be some consulting that folks shouldn't just try and be the local block Walmart uh, because just the pricing will be difficult and we've seen people be price sensitive. Well, and if I can just expand on that question, um, one thing I wasn't clear on is, is there um, sort of a market research component to the technical assistance that's provided um, for these stores as they're sort of trying to identify? I, I noticed there was a mention of branding, um, but it's, but certainly it seems like trying to identify your market, what, what the traffic flows might be or um, sort of the market needs within a certain area, is that something that's sort of been part of this approach so far? Through the Healthy Neighborhood Market Network training? Mm -hmm. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's definitely a topic we've covered. So the way that we have to date put together those trainings, and I think we're moving more towards a consolidation of information into sort of a curriculum, um, but is that we've essentially leveraged the Food Policy Council network because we have such a great network of uh, industry professionals, both on the retail side, on the distribution side, um, people who are engaged in doing marketing and branding consulting for businesses across the board who are super interested in food and want to support this kind of work. Um, and yeah, understanding your customer base, understanding community needs. We've played a, put a lot of uh, focus as well on the value of community partnerships because there's a lot of neighborhood institutions and community-based organizations that either want to do, want to do market makeover projects or they want to figure out how they can best support them. And if I could make a little plug for, for that from a strategic point of view, we think it makes a lot of sense to create some sort of neighborhood institution purchasing uh, commitment. So, you know, it's great to do cooking demos and get people really excited about healthy food and have a healthy food party at the store and engage residents in that way. But if you can get your local community, clinic, school, library, neighborhood council, to make a pledge to, to buy food in a consistent way, um, and that's a mutual, mutually beneficial partnership because, you know, the church or the neighborhood council or what have you, they're, they're going to have a picnic eventually or um, a wedding or something that they need to buy food or napkins for. They should be getting it from their local corner store that's trying to bring healthier food. That's going to really sustain that project. And at the same time, through that exchange, the store owner is, Dire getting direct information on what people need and what people want and the kind of price points they're going to be comfortable with. So you're getting both market research and sort of ongoing uh, purchasing power in the store environment through those kind of partnerships. That's, that seems like a great strategy and a great way to get that information without outlaying a lot of costs. Um, exactly. And I guess the, the final question that I had was really um, tying in environmental health um, it sounds like increasingly there's this effort to sort of step outside the environmental health um, typical paradigm and move towards, uh, you know, really helping to promote this type of community-based, um, you know, healthy food option. And uh, from your perspective, Jeff, are there any sort of next steps that would be particularly constructive um, 
in moving towards that continuum or in facilitating increased uh, healthy fare in these situations? Well, as far as next steps, I, I think continue on the same path that we're going um, and keeping it going because a lot of times um, in collaborative efforts, sometimes um, people lose focus or certain uh, entities that are part of that uh, drop off, but keeping it, this whole thing going I think would increase um, you know, more and more interest of these business owners in maybe uh, trying something different in their business or um, maybe a new business owner that maybe has a new concept that would go into one of these um, uh, small corner markets. Um, and I think just the continuing of it really is what, as far as me uh, going here from an environmental health uh, perspective, I, I think just going the same and keeping uh, moving with it. Yeah. That's great. Well, I want to congratulate you all for your, um, your wonderful collaborative approach and, and this great work. Uh, and I hope that we can hear about it more in the future. And I think one area that could be really interesting is the notion of how this ties in with um, our efforts to improve transit and transportation, non-automotive non transportation, and sort of positioning markets um, as we seek to create more complete communities. Um, but it's, it's wonderful to hear that this is um, coming together from a variety of angles. So, so thank you all again for your time today. And I just wanted, in wrapping up, to, um, to let you know that our next meeting is going to be on June 17th from 2 to 3 p.m., which is our, our normal time. We'll be returning to our 2 to 3 p.m. time slot. And the topic will be um, Waste Not OC with Dr. Eric Handler, who is the health officer for the Orange County Healthcare Agency. Um, this is a very interesting uh, initiative that's going on in Orange County where they're working to um, increase the donation of wholesome surplus food from uh, retailers and restaurants to local food banks um, as a part of an effort to reduce the food waste stream. So I hope that you'll consider joining us for that conversation um, in June. And thank you again to Mina Brown for organizing this great call and to Gail uh, Hoxter for helping navigate through our three speakers today. Thank you, everyone, and I hope you'll join us next time. Excuse me, hello? Yeah. Uh, I wasn't able to see the webinar or firewall. Is there any way we can get the PowerPoint or um, I believe the first speaker, is it Claire from yeah. Food Policy? Um, is there any way we could have the PowerPoint and, and um, if we want to contact for individual questions, would that be possible? Absolutely. And um, we have your email. Well, actually, um, go ahead and if you aren't able to, if you have any of our emails, and I hope you have either Mina Brown's or mine, Carla Blackmore's. If not, you can find us on the web at phsocal.org. Okay. Go ahead and uh, shoot us an email, and we will respond with that information. And hopefully, we can uh, also work on getting your your firewall to work with our software in the future. All right, thank you. So, thank you so much. Okay. Any other questions before we close out? Okay, with that, I think we will end our call. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Thank you.